Hi, I'm Roger Glover of Deep Purple, and you are watching and listening to Linear Rock. Good morning, Roger. Oh, is it morning already? <laughs> Good heavens. I went to sleep like this. Welcome to <coughs> Milan. Welcome back to <coughs> Milan, actually. And welcome to Linear Rock. Always a pleasure to be here. Okay, so let's start with the easy question. <laughs> uh, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second <coughs> easy question. Okay, how does it feel to be the bassist of one of the most influential band in rock history? Actually, I don't know. You'd have to ask someone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't feel any different to uh, any other person, really. I mean, it's. Uh, I suppose intellectually, you realise that you're in a band that's uh, had a long history and a, and a, a lot of success, um, and that's it's very gratifying. But it, you know, that's behind. It, it, we're always kind of moving forward. So now it's the next step. It's okay. always the next step. In fact, we are here presenting the new record, which is coming out April 7, 2017. It's called Infinite, and it's the 20th studio album for Deep Purple. Uh, a very evocative title, I must say, for some of the hardest working musicians in rock, um, who actually, a few months ago, um, announced the farewell tour. So it quite seems, you know, some way to go in contradiction, Infinite, but it's a long goodbye as well. So, um, was just, you know, a choice to, to actually pick a title like that in this moment, why now? Um, actually, the choice wasn't ours as a band. And it also, we haven't announced a farewell tour. It's, we've announced a long goodbye, so we don't know actually when or how long it's going to be. Okay. Um, because we don't know. That's the simple answer to that. Um, you know, there's five of us in the band, and we're all sort of fairly um, strong-headed. We have, all have ideas, and none of us could come up with a really decent album title. Sometimes we start off with an album title before we even start writing stuff. We have a title, which actually is great. It's, it gives you a kind of a framework within which to work. But um, on this album, we were forging ahead, and we, we couldn't agree on a title. And Edel, Edel, the record company had this, uh, they loved what, on Now What, the question mark, and yeah. it was a simple, strong image. Yeah. And they were looking for something similar. And they suggested this, the, the infinite, infinity okay. curve, which my young we, daughter, by the way, says it's just like her nostrils. Yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and forms a DP as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, they sort of presented us with this title, and we thought about it, and okay. But it, by the time we looked at the, the artwork and stuff, we were sold. It was a great idea. And infinite, you know, it means whatever you want it to mean. It means maybe the music is infinite and we're not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or, or whatever it, you, wherever you want it to mean, really. Um, and the long goodbye tour is, uh, again, whatever you want it to mean, uh, or whatever it will turn out to be, okay. <laughs> one of the two. Maybe it will be like an infinite goodbye tour. But yeah, yeah, maybe we'll be going to say <laughs> saying goodbye forever. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this record is another Deep Purple masterpiece. Um, pure Deep Purple 70s sound, but with a fresh okay. taste as well. Fresh ideas in that, which is absolutely you know amazing after so many years and so many records that you have a great enthusiasm and mm -hmm. new ideas. But it has also like a melancholic aftertaste uh, in a sense especially the first three songs, you know, and um, that's what I, you know, as I perceived it. Mm. Uh, but, I mean, you announced, you know, the, the, the last tour, but this is not going to be the last album. We don't know. Um, as Don Airy said, uh, he thought the last album was going to be the last album. <laughs> um, <clears throat> personally, I'd, I'd love to do another album. I mean, the last two albums have been such a, a pleasure. Okay. So. Uh, to work with Bob Ezrin, and I think they've been very productive and, and very good albums. And certainly now, what was a real shot in the arm for us. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't particularly want to stop. Um, I'm sure there's another album in us at least. Okay. But 
who knows? Who knows? Okay. And how do a band, you know, like Deep Purple, have done it all uh, after 50 years, realize and feels that it's time to do a new record, which is the mechanism and uh, the motivation is any different now since, you know, also the market, the music industry changed a lot. Yeah. Well, back in the 70s, we used to do an album a year. Um, in fact, in 72, we did six tours of America, an album and a tour of Japan. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine doing that now. Uh, the mechanism, it's interesting you use that, the mechanism <laughs> to, to do an album or not. When we finished Now What, I wanted to do an al another album straight away. Okay. You know, do a quick tour and I get back in the studio while right. we're still hot, you know. Um, but that's obviously um, not going to happen. Um, we toured and toured. Um, Bob Ezrin actually really wanted to do another album as much as we did. So okay. that was a real um, encouraging thing and an encouraging sign. And we've kept in touch. I mean, he's become a very good friend. Yeah. And every now and again, he'd say, yeah, when are you going to do another album? You know, <laughs> it's, it's, he's, he's eager to do it. And uh, I guess we started thinking about it um, a couple of years ago. We had a, uh, an initial writing session in a studio in Portugal. Um, and then we had another writing session in Germany. And from those two writing sessions came a bunch of ideas which we worked on a little bit. Um, no finished songs, just lots of jams and ideas and riffs and whatever. And then we had um, two weeks with Bob Ezrin in Nashville where we played him what we'd got and he made his comments and we adjusted things accordingly and then, then we went in the studio and bashed it down very quickly. Yeah. And quick, you know, the, the way we work quickly is, is I think really important because that's when you capture freshness. If you're doing uh, the twentieth or thirtieth take of a song, it's it's kind of soulless at that point. So if we don't get it in the first two, maybe even three takes, okay, then we leave it for the day, and come back to it. So that's why, and we record and write actually in exactly the same way as we did in the seventies. No, oh. all of us in the same room. Okay, all of us playing together. Wow, feeding off each other. That that still works. You have to feel the band. It's, I think it's important. Yeah, you know? I mean, even if you're playing things exactly correctly, yeah. there's always slight movements and, and, and you look at each other and go, oh, what's coming next? And, oh, I can see he's going to do a fill, so I know it's going to, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. We barely have learned the songs when we record them. Oh, It's not as if they're, they're um, eminently playable right away. So uh, frequently when you do a song in a studio, by the time you get to the stage, it, it actually changes. The, the way you play it changes. The, yeah. you, you, you find over time the way to play a song. In the studio, it's just the first first stab at it. Yeah. So you mentioned Bob Ezrin, of course. You know, everybody defines quite an experience to to work with him. You yeah. know, he's huge, world famous producer, and he's got a particular taste, and um, you can hear when it's Bob behind the desk. Wow, but. Um, you, Roger, are also, you know, a famous and valued producer. Uh, is it for you any harder than for the other members, the relation, you know, with the producer, which is can be Bob or mm -hmm. anybody else? Uh, um, or when it comes to your own music, it's always better to have an outsider pu putting the final touch. Well, an outsider is always good to have, but finding the right outside is very difficult. <laughs> um, you, there's got to be a lot of trust there. And uh, Bob has proved himself time and again. Um, and we uh, leave it up to him, basically. Uh, I'm very happy for him to produce. I don't want to produce this band. I've had enough of that. It's not, uh, it's not an easy task when one person in the band stands up and tries to tell the other four what to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't tell you the language they use, but <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> Um, but the overview of, of someone in the band is, is going to be slightly different to the overview of someone outside the band. And I think Bob is just um, is a very intelligent, very energetic, dynamic person. Um, says what he thinks. Yeah. And that's important. If you're, if you're trying to pussyfoot around things, that it's, you know, it, doesn't, it, it just takes time. He cuts right to the chase. And he helps us to solve our own internal Differences, you know. Someone says, "Oh, I think the riff's that way," or someone said, "The riff's that way." Bob can we go? No, nope, we're doing it that way. 
boom, you've just saved two hours of studio time, which is you know expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's very good like that, and he gives me the credit of being a, a fellow producer, okay. which made me feel very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the studio, he'll frequently make a decision or something, and then uh, they'll turn to me and say, "What do you think?" You know. So that's I feel included. Okay. Um, and I don't feel left out whatsoever. I'm, I'm very happy for him to make those decisions. And what's the story um, behind, you know, the leftover tracks that ended up on an EP released separately on February 3rd? Uh, why this choice? They were maybe too good to be ignored or um, maybe not fitting the album completely and you decided to, to have them out separately? Well, it's a... It's a difficult thing to actually talk about. We, we, we write a lot of stuff and what it boils down to is just is pairing it out so that we get the best. Um, we don't always agree on that either but um, sometimes we agree sometimes a, a song just it's got a lot of promise just doesn't work out and I think we started out with 14 or 15 ideas um, and there are nine on the album and then of course Roadhouse Blues. Yeah. Um, but some of those I think we will return to. There's one in particular that is absolutely great that we never managed to finish. And that, that you know, happens from time to time. I found on Perpendicular, I found a track we did on Perpendicular that's almost finished, vocals and everything. And boy, it sounds great. But at the time, we didn't think it was so good. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day that will come out as well. Okay. And, uh why cover of Roadhouse Blues from The Doors? Why now, actually? And it, it's actually such a brilliant cover because, you know, close enough to the original, but with that DP imprinting. So, great track uh, to close the album. And uh, so why now? Why, why that, that song? Well, the easy answer is why not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it is, we did it on the last album. We did a, a Jerry Lee Lewis song. Um, and Bob, towards the end of the session, said, hey, do you fancy doing another cover just for fun? You know, that was all it was. Okay. Uh, Pacey had played Roadhouse Blues with a tribute band and enjoyed it and said, how about that? So from that decision, half an hour later, it was done. Okay. Just so it. you decided in the studio <clears throat> and it was done? Yeah. Well. We, we, you know, we, it, to do those things, you don't really want to have to learn something and work it out and this stuff. It's, it's got to come fresh. And doing a song that we all know, everyone everyone knows Roadhouse Blues, part of our sort of DNA, if you like. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so once we got the words, one take, Done. all of us in the studio, vocals, the harmonica, the lot, all one take, half an hour. Wow. Job completed. Fantastic. And um, was the docu film that you you actually? Uh, did in the studio um, that will be released with limited edition of Infinite. Uh, was it an idea of the band? And did you film a particular phases of the recording, or you filmed it all and then edited some extra work for for you? I guess. Um, Craig Hooper and his company. Um, I've known them for a long time. They're, they're Welsh, like me, and uh, in fact, they did a documentary on me many years ago. Okay. Um, and then a few years after that, they did a documentary for Ian Gillen. These were sort of solo things, really. Okay. But then Craig approached us and said, you know, every documentary or every feature that he's seen about Deep Purple all, always focuses on the 70s. Yeah. Smoke on the Water, et al., Machine Head, you know, that's... And he said, you know, I want to do a documentary from Steve onwards, from Steve Morse onwards. Uh, yeah, you can mention the past, but... Really, the, the, the consistency and, and, uh, and the happiness of the band over the last 23 years is undocumented. And that was basically his idea. Okay. And uh, we thought it was a great idea because you know, you, having a great past is wonderful, um, but you don't always want to like, haul it out of the bag and say, look what we did <laughs> years ago, you know. <laughs> so, uh, excuse me. So, uh, yeah, um, we thought it was a good idea. Um, and it just happened to coincide with uh, us making a record. Okay. I mean, he, he came to the O2 and recorded a few bits and pieces. Um, we had no idea what sort of shape it was going to be. Um, he wanted to be a fly on the wall. And uh, his team, they're a very small team, and we know them, so it's not as if they're strangers or anything. 
and they just hid in corners and looked through mm -hmm. windows and you know we to capture the real moment after an hour or so you forget they're there yeah. and and that's that's the key you know okay to capture us being really who we are because when the camera's on you're always aware of a camera you know so yeah. make sure you look good well <laughs> no we don't give it, we don't care about that but you know what i mean is yeah, yes. you're aware if if you have a conversation with one person uh, and you have a conversation with another person in the room, the conversation is going to be different. Yeah. Because you're then talking to sure. two people instead of one. Well, the same happens with a, with a camera. Um, if you're aware of the camera, you're talking to the camera. And, you know, that's not what we want to have. That's not what he wanted to happen. Okay. And also, by profession, he's an investigative journalist. So he knows how to, you know, weed his way into situations okay. and, and get the yeah. truth. And it, I must say, it came out much better than I thought it was. It's very revealing and very human. And I think it, it's great because people see us as a band, they see us on stage, but they don't see us being ourselves. Yeah. They see us as musicians on, on stage. Yes. Um, so you actually get to know the personalities a bit more of the band. And I think that's really good. The cover artwork is marvelous and very <coughs> evocative, just like the title. Um, did the concept come from your idea, Roger, since you have also huge talent in painting and photography? And also I saw a video of you guys signing some canvas of that mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. So what is that about? Yeah, I painted it all. I did <laughs> it was, again, purely uh, from ear, ear music. Um, the, the infinity symbol uh, was first presented to us in a kind of um, in a different form. It was in a sort of neon tube sign okay. doing that, and that was pretty good. Um, but uh, I, I think we all said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Or, we didn't all get together, by the way. This is you know, he sent out to different emails. We're all living in different parts of the world, so making a decision is kind of difficult unless we're on tour and we're all together. Sure. And even then, it's hard. Um, but uh, when they sent this, uh, the boat and the icebreaker, man, I was blown away. I thought, well, that's a great, great image. Yeah. So there was, there, was no, there was no discussion about it. That's it. It's perfect. And then they came up with the concept of dressing us all up in vintage Arctic clothing. And uh, <laughs> I mean, that was a bit of fun. And I think it's great because how many bands do you see photographs of where they all <clears throat> look the same? Yeah. They're all... Yes. looking mean or they're going crazy you know it's like one of the two and and <laughs> we just wanted to be a bit different and this this presented itself as a, a, a lovely way to be different as joe elliott from Def leopard once stated and i'm sure the <clears throat> whole world you know agrees in 1971 there were only three bands that matter Led zeppelin black sabbath and deep purple um, which is still the holy trinity of art and heavy rock. How do you leave it? And is there anything in particular that you have envied to the other two bands through the years? Envied? <laughs> <laughs> um, not really. I, I, I didn't actually know much about Black Sabbath. I thought Paranoid was a great single. I love that. Um, but the, the depths of the albums I never really got into. Okay. Um, Zeppelin I heard before I joined Purple, just you know, within a couple of weeks. Um, and I loved it, that first Zeppelin album blew me away. Um, and changed my thinking about music, actually. Um, the word heavy was being used a lot in mid to the late 60s, heavy music. I mean, Hendrix and Cream were sort of paving the way, if you like. Um, and um, I thought heavy, well, the band I was in before Purple, we thought heavy was just having more equipment and playing louder. <laughs> it, it's not that. <laughs> uh, it just sounded the same old stuff, but louder. It, just, you know, didn't, it was a cacophony, actually, in, in at times. <laughs> um, but uh, I suddenly realized when I listened to Zeppelin, especially um, Dazed and Confused and How Many More Times, heavy didn't mean loud and big. It was an attitude. Yeah. That was the key. And right on the heels of that came this the, you know, meeting Deep Purple. So it was, um, it was a, a meeting of disparate things that all of a sudden um, I've actually got, got the knowledge of where I'm going a little bit. Yeah. As opposed to just shooting any in the dark, you know. 
Um, Actually, Richard... excuse, excuse my metaphors. I've oh, just okay. Back. It's early in the morning here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so last question for today. So Rishi Blackmore is back to rock with a new incarnation of Rainbow, another band you've been part of and also a producer of uh, from 78 to up to 83. Um, what do you think of this return? Uh, Honestly, you know, I can't really talk about it in, in, okay. in any, any way like that, except to say that I think Richie is the most fantastic auteur originating guitarist I've ever worked with, and uh, I'm honored to have been in a band with him for so long. And I just honestly wish him luck. And uh, I can't comment on the, on the shows, I didn't see the shows. Okay, I've seen comments of fans and stuff, some like, some don't. I mean. But uh, I just, I just hope he's happy, and I hope okay. that when he comes back out, that you know, it's, it's going to be a success for him. Okay, so this one was quick. Very, very last question. As a bassist, uh, you did not have the virtuoso approach in, you know, through the years in your career, but certainly you are a leader of bass playing uh, for your strong soundness and groove. And also for your attitude, you know, to put the bass at the complete service of the rhythm of the song as a pillar, as a substain. Um, was this your vision since the very beginning? Because I know you actually are a repentant guitarist. And what do you think about virtuoso players like Jakub Pastorius or Billy Sheehan? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for that uh, description of my bass playing. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I can live up to that. <laughs> You, you, know, you can, of course. The, the, the thing about me is that my main thrust in life is songwriting. I was always a songwriter since I was 13. I, I wrote my first song at 13. And songwriting is, is, is really what I'm most interested in. Playing bass is just part of that. Um, I'm lucky enough to be in a band with Ian Pace because Ian Pace is, a, first of all, unique. As a, as a subtle swing to his, his playing that no other, I mean, I can always tell Pace is playing. No other drummer comes back. Um, and I'm, he makes me sound good. So I, 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 can't, I can't take all the credit for, for being the, the bass player. That That's you think very about. humble from you. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, uh, Pace is great to play with. I, I, I know him inside out now. I know the way he, I know when he's coming out for a fill and I know when to be with him, you know. So it's, uh, it's yeah, I mean, Bass playing, I love playing bass. I think it's it's the most powerful instrument. Um, there's an old joke saying, what's the definition of a bass player? Well, it's halfway between a drummer and a musician. <laughs> and and the thing about that is, that, although it's funny, it's, it's partly true because bass is also a percussion instrument and a tuned instrument. And so it, it's, you can identify a song really by the singer and the bass. If you, if you had only two people, a singer and a bass player would be it, because that, that gives you the whole picture. Um, of course, it wouldn't sound as good, but, uh, but you know, that's the essence of, of bass playing to me. It's, it's the foundation from which other things can yeah. fly off. Roger, thanks very much for your time. It's been an honor, really, and um, can't wait to see you back on stage in Italy next oh, June. Oh, me neither. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you so much. Thank you.